Okay, fun at the Food Network. What we're talking about now essentially is the development in media, television, that has really taken off in, a, in an enormous way in the past quarter of a century. And that is the concept of food as a medium for entertainment, that food is the germinating essence of forms of programming, and not just cooking food, but travel shows with food, contests with food, and so forth. And the roots of this can be traced back to late 1994 and the birth of the Food Network in the United States of America. These, now there are food networks virtually in every country that has television. But this was the original. And I was uh, blessed, fortunate enough to be on the air the night that it launched in late 1994. And um, I helped develop some programming, and I, I hosted a couple of shows on the Food Network. And uh, the first one I hosted was a show called TV Diners. Now, TV Diners uh, was, and to this day still is, the only national restaurant review show that has ever existed on television. Which, that sounds like a good idea, right? You're interested in restaurants. You, oh, there's a restaurant in Denver. There's one in San Francisco. And you would think, even if you're not in the business, well, how would you produce a show that has to do with restaurant reviews? You would think, well, if you're doing a show in Chicago, you'd go to Chicago, you'd go to the restaurant, you'd have a few meals, you'd interview the chef, of course. But in the early days of the Food Network, we didn't have money to do that. This is how TV diners worked. And I'm going to give you the example of one restaurant we did called Joe's Chop House in Denver. What we, do, what we did was we would get some reviews on the restaurant to make sure it was a good restaurant. And we would hire a one-man crew for a day to go to the restaurant shoot the exterior, the interior, meet Joe the chef, have Joe the chef prepare something, get some sound bites from customers, and then give us the videotape. We would edit that into a package. But then, of course, we needed some actual food. My co-host was Nina Griscom, was a little set like we were in a diner, and we reviewed three restaurants in one day. So let's follow the journey of Joe's signature dish, Joe's Mighty Veal Chop, okay? So the day that the cameraman visits the restaurant, Chef Joe makes his Mighty Veal Chop preparation. Then, at our instructions, FedExes us the veal chop. That's, that's the first sign that there's going to be some problems here. The veal chop is wrapped up with the, you know, with the potatoes and the gravy and everything, and it gets overnighted to the Food Network, okay? So it comes in, and at some point... The day it arrives, the, the, our, our, our man who is in charge of food gets it and takes it out of the box, and it goes in the refrigerator. Now, that sounds good. So maybe it's only been unrefrigerated for, say, I don't know, 14, 15 hours. I mean, the average mighty veal chop could stand up to that, right? So then uh, we taped six shows a day, and uh, the show essentially we taped about every eight to ten days. So eight or nine days later, the show, the, the Mighty Veal Chop's been in the refrigerator. We sit down at about nine in the morning to tape the first of six shows, and each show takes an hour. So that day at eight or 7.30 in the morning, the food stylist goes to all the Food Network refrigerators and on six different tables arranges the three dishes that constitute each, each day's show. So Joe's Mighty Veal Chop is the caboose, like it's on the last of the six tables. And it's been out, now it's been out since 7.30 in the morning in a hot television studio. It's been a long time since Seth Joe made the Mighty Veal Chop. So when the time comes that Nina and I are actually looking at Chef Joe's Mighty Veal Chop, supposedly saying, you know, flattering things about it, it looks like a sewer cover. It, it has changed color, and I remember commenting, well, isn't that interesting? Chef Joe somehow has attached the smallest mushrooms I've ever seen to the veal chop. But no, they're actually spores were growing. And Nina says, well, by word, Bill, those wasabi mashed potatoes look really wonderful. They weren't 
wasabi mashed potatoes. The mashed potatoes that, mashed potatoes that actually turned green. So that was, that was the, that one show and the story of Joe's Mighty Veal Chop. Today, the Food Network is a colossus. They would have the money to go all over the world to do a show like that. And not just on the Food Network. There were two Food Networks in America. And as I said before, there are Food Networks all over the world. There's programming on ABC, NBC, everything about food. But back in those days, people were incredulous that we could launch a, a network about food. And I really mean that. We take it for granted now. And we had a great deal of difficulty getting advertisers. So from each economic quarter, would we make it to the next quarter, or would the Food Network go off the air? And so I remember this meeting, the third quarter. We were nervous. We were, we were going to get canceled. The Food Network, we didn't have advertising. And Joe Langan, the guy who was in charge of like, the advertising, calls in the original crew, uh, Emeril Lagasse, Bobby Flay, me, uh, I say Sarah Moulton, David Rosegarden, and myself. And he says, I, I never forget this, we're all nervous, will we get a sponsor? He says, uh, I've got a potential sponsor for the next quarter, um, will keep us on the air, but I... Uh, uh, I, I, I got to run this by you. Oh, this is great, Joe. Great. Yeah, I just, uh, just got to kind of, you know, run it by you and then talk about it. Sure. What, what's up? He said, well, uh, I just, it's important that, that I run it by you. And Sarah Malt says, Joe, who is a sponsor? And Joe says, Roach Traps. And Sarah Moulton says, I, Joe, you know, I can't see myself saying, you know, I'll be right back to finish this sweet and ink squid and ink risotto after a message from our little friends at Roach Traps, all right? Anyway, how did I get involved in this? How does a guy get involved in, you know, being on the Food Network? I love restaurants. I'm not a chef in particularly. Well, the truth is, when I take the big sleep, the six feet under sleep, I'll really be lucky if the New York Times gives me an obituary about this big. But the one thing I hope they mention is the one, in fact, the only thing I've ever actually invented in my entire career on television. You, you know what that is? The concept of interviewing people and eating at the same time. So yes, in the, that lofty notion can be ascribed to me. So in the pantheon of the TV greats, you've got Sarnoff, RCA, Cable, Ted Turner, News, Walter Cronkite, Daytime TV, David Frost, Late night, Johnny Carson, and then down, 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 way down on the list, uh, right here under talking car, talking horse, Mr. Ed, Bill Boggs, talking to people while eating. That's right. I have milked this notion since about 1977, and the truth of the matter is, it wasn't my idea in the first place. Let me see if you can guess who gave me this idea. Hmm? No, heavens, no, not my lovely. Oh, no, back then we didn't even know each other. Would that we had, darling. Anyway, no, this happens to be a Shakespearean actor from Canada who was the first Captain Kirk in Star Trek. I'm talking about William Shatner. Let me tell you the story of how he gave me the idea. Lucas, let's take a look at William Shatner. We're doing a show, my show Midday. He got there, and our show was on at lunchtime. He says, Bill, I'm really hungry. Can you get me a sandwich? I said, sure, Bill. We'll I'll send out for a sandwich. I send out for, what do you want? I want a turkey sandwich. So we send out for a turkey sandwich. We do a segment. It's not there yet. Where's my sandwich? I'm starving. I'm starving. Come on. I said, well, it's coming. He said, this is on at lunchtime. You should eat an interview, and people at home will eat and watch. So this man gave me the idea for doing that. And obviously, he got the sandwich. <laughs> OK. Now, but the, the truth of the matter is that I thought, that's a good idea, right? It's lunchtime. So once a week on this show, we started to do a round table. Let's take a look at the round table. We would get a bunch of celebrities in. Uh, Lucas, round table, please. Yeah, and we'd sit around at a restaurant with caterers. Now, where else could you possibly see disco queen Donna Summer sitting next to Geraldine Ferraro, vice presidential candidate? And this 
concept worked. People loved it. Sometimes we did it with four people, five people, or big round tables like this. This <clears throat> midday round table concept evolved into, evolved into my show, Bill Boggs Corner Table on the Food Network, which was a scam I mentioned the other day. This show, the Food Network wanted to do something that was not just a chef cooking behind a table, right? And so I said, well, I used to do this thing on Midday and on Channel 4 and WNBC where I interviewed celebrities over a meal. They liked it. So I came up with the title, Bill Boss Corner Table, and the concept was basically, as I say, Jane knows it, it was like a scam. I talked to Food Network in letting me do this show, which meant going to the greatest restaurants in America, sitting down with major celebrities, eating for free, and being on television, right? I mean, you know, I should be investigated for this. But anyway, uh, yeah, they paid me to have lunch with Sophia Loren. But what I noticed early on when I was doing those shows, those roundtable shows, and it's true, that something different happens in the interview process as a talk show host when you're interviewing people over food in a familiar setting with food and sometimes wine that would not happen in a traditional talk show format like you see with a host behind a desk. And I'm going to show you two, ex two well, a lot of examples, but two examples of that. And the first is with somebody who's just, his whole career just went down the tubes, Matt Lauer, who was a longtime host of the Today Show, uh, and this was, he and I had worked together, and I was on the Food Network, and he came and actually helped me launch uh, Bill Box Corner Table by being my first major celebrity. This was a long time ago. This was just after he took over the Today Show, when he had huge wealth, huge fame, and unfortunately, tragic, horrible disgrace in front of him. But we're at a restaurant downtown in the village. He orders some oysters, which leads me to the inevitable question about oysters as an aphrodisiac, and watch what happens. Here we are. How many times in your career have you had to do a conversation with somebody about oysters and oysters as, as an aphrodisiac? I am so fed up with that topic. Do you remember there was a show I did, and you remember this show? I did a, a terrible, terrible program for about a year here in New York where we would cover this on a regular basis, this type of show, where it was the... Nine you know, Broadcast Plaza. Thanks for remembering, Bill. Our, our you know, you could have fished around for that a little bit before no, just coming come right, right out, with out with it. I'll tell you why. Because we can't even find tapes of the program. Do you know why? Erased. I have destroyed those tapes. <laughs> I have destroyed those tapes. What that, was the worst moment that you can remember from Nine Broadcast Plaza? And if you say it's a guy asking you about... Did you, were you comfortable with women? I'll kill you. The, well, what, the, what, the, the lowest point. We have a uh, publicist from NBC over in the corner here who's going to scream when I say this, but I will tell you I had to do an hour and a half. This was a three-hour live show right. every day. I had to do an hour and a half on women who fake orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> do I look like the kind of guy who's be comfortable talking about that for, for a half a minute, much less an hour and a half? I'm sure it's a subject you weren't even familiar with. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about this. If you're interviewing a celebrity, the big concern was, how can I be on television and eat? And I said, don't worry. If there's anything that's indiscreet, we're going to edit the show. These were not live shows. But I, as the host, had to be deft with the timing of my questions. I mean, I, if my guest was just about to put a piece of Joe's Mighty Veal Chop in their mouth, I couldn't ask him a question, but at that point I had to, you know, finesse it. So I, I made a mistake with uh, the lovely Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York, when she was on a show, which we shot, but the corner table show, we shot this in the Food Network's a kitchen. She was on promoting a diet book for Weight Watchers. Keep that in mind. And uh, watch what happens again, because we're in a food setting with a quick thinking uh, production assistant in the kitchen when we talk about Twinkies. Let's take a look at Fergie. Impression that, 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 that certainly from reading your book, uh, that, that separation during your marriage when, when Prince Andrew was away and you were pregnant, you said that at that point you went up to 200 pounds, mm. you know? What do you say to somebody watching right now who is really reaching for food as an emotional companion? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Definition. You certainly can. Mm -hmm. You can keep talking for a bit now. So what, what to do is, while she's finishing that bite, <laughs> just put your hand down for one second, you know. Stay away from the Twinkies for one moment, and Twinkies. we'll get an answer. What are Twinkies? What are Twinkies? Mm. Oh, oh no. we, when I come with Trevor, we're going to have a case of Twinkies for Crazy you and the Twinkies. girls. Mm -hmm. Twinkies are an American fast food product that is right. a cake mm -hmm. that has cream inside. Mm -hmm. They're really not too, we have some here? Oh, hand over the Twinkies. <laughs> here, um, just the whole box. Now, I don't want to, sub I, do, I don't want to suggest that you know, you go off the one, well, two, three no. plan. We'll check, we'll check the fiber and the diet content, so we might be able to have one if we haven't been I don't know if they today. have fiber. Mm. What? What is the thing? Uh, dietary fiber zero. Zero fiber? Yeah. Protein one. One protein. Total carbohydrate 25. Oh, Sodium. Up. <laughs> what else? Sodium 200. 200? Yeah. Oh, I can see the water retention Absolutely. first thing in the can't morning. You, can't you? <laughs> Okay, great. There's well, I want to have to show you one. Sorry, sorry. You can't take it this okay, far. Sorry. Look how handsomely they're wrapped. <laughs> they're really nice. Ah. And this is one of those things. Now, this is the thing. Is, this is one of those. you got to go with this. This is like a photo opportunity. It can only be opened with your teeth. All right. Okay. The only way that you can open a twink. Smudge my lips. No, I, that's why I did okay. it for you. Oh, now. Fine. Thank you. All right. Yeah. It's a kitchen. Yeah, it's a kitchen. And there you see in the Twinkie are the three little portholes of... Twinkies. Cream. Wow. <laughs> now, I can assure you that when she left the studio, even though she was promoting a Weight Watchers book, her Prada bag had so many Twinkies in it, it looked like she was carrying a bowling ball out of there. She seemed to like the Twinkies. Now, we have another little thing coming up, a blooper. We shot that day. Hi, I'm Sarah, the Duchess of York, and um, I would love you to join me at the corner table with Bill Bloggs. Oh. <laughs> you can call me whatever you want, <laughs> Duchess. <laughs> one more time. Oh, that was, that was great. That. I would use that. Let's just do another one. Fergie was great. We shot two shows together, actually, one, a, another one a year later, when she had another book to promote um, about dieting. Well, because we're on the Food Network, I couldn't just interview people in a restaurant. It was crucial that we had a strong food component to, the, to each show on the corner table show. So we had to do a food demo. Now, the food demo generally, and I edited the shows, generally was about 90 seconds of the chef in that restaurant demonstrating a dish he wanted to demonstrate on television. Well, these chefs were so happy that they were going to be on television cooking and demonstrating something. They hired food stylists to set up their kitchens. They would go on and on, like, oh, yeah, 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 25 minutes. And I'm thinking to myself, they're going to go nuts when I edit this down into, like, 90 seconds. But they would, like, send me bottles of champagne. Oh, Bill, I loved it. I love being on the show. So I'll show you two examples of two actually wonderful cooking uh, demos. Uh, the first is with Donnie and Marie, shot at Rockefeller Center at the Sea Grill, the wonderful seafood restaurant uh, at Rockefeller Center. And this is the best single recipe I've ever seen for crab cakes. If you like crab cakes, Ed Brown really runs us through it. And note that as a filler to bind the crab cakes, you know what he uses? Cornflakes, right? And the second is with, with the late, great uh, American comedian Joan Rivers at Le Cirque restaurant on Madison Avenue. And the chef there, Sotha Kuhn, is making an extremely elaborate sea bass dish. And then we get a little lesson in table manners from Joan Rivers. So let's go to the Sea Grill first with Donnie Marie. Sea Grill here in Rockefeller Center for Donnie and Marie. After 35 years in jaded and cynical show business, you think they still like each other? Let's find out. Well, this is a treat to welcome to our corner table, Marie and Donnie. <laughs> no, 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 no. Marie Start that over. No, 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 no. Bill. I'm Bill. changing the boat. I, I'm walking what? away right now. Feel like, we'll see, it's okay. We'll let him have it again because it's, you know, age before beauty. Under the umbrellas at the Sea Grill in one of the world's most familiar locations, Rockefeller Center. Let's go into the kitchen of the Sea Grill and see how that aficionado of fish, executive chef Ed Brown, makes those crab cakes that Marie likes so much. He starts with the freshest lump crab meat, then adds mayonnaise, an egg yolk, 
salt, cayenne pepper, Old Bay seasoning, and mustard. We're just mixing this enough to combine the ingredients gently, and I don't want to shred the crab meat and defeat the purpose of having those nice big jumbo lumps. Then Ed forms the crab cake into a ball and coats it with cornflake crumbs. Put it on top. With a little bit of butter on top, Ed finishes the crab cakes by baking them in a 375 degree oven for six minutes. And those are our signature jumbo lunch crab cakes. So here we go with Joan Rivers again at the Cirque restaurant. We're enjoying the meal. You want a little lobster? Just a touch? A touch. All right, here. Yeah. I'll give you the part with the truffle on it right now. The lobster express coming through. Take a little pause. But first, let's take a peek inside Le Cirque's million dollar kitchen and meet innovative executive chef Sotha Kuhn, who's Look at preparing this setup. striped bass steamed in lemongrass for Joan. Sotha begins by chopping several pieces of lemongrass and boiling them until they're soft. He then fillets the striped bass and designs the fillets in a rose pattern. Sotha then inserts a small lemon section in the center of the rose and seasons with salt, pepper, and lemon juice. Put one uh, little bit of lemon. The striped bass rose is steamed over lemongrass together with leaf-shaped zucchini slices for five minutes. Okay. Sotha plates his exotic Put creation, adorns it with a generous helping of beluga caviar, caviar, and dresses it with a lemon caviar sauce. Mm, it's it's good. caviar and steamed fish. Mm. It is so wonderful. This just came up during the course of the meal, and she went off on it, which I, I found interesting. Well, Joan, as an arbiter of style, what do you think about table manners these oh, days? Don't start with me. No table one manners. has them, and it's so important. This, this is not That's a boat. That's not good, right. You're not rowing a boat. How about this? Posture. 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 Not knowing that you're supposed to bread, bread. I hate when people butter their bread up here. Bread is buttered on the plate. Uh, on the, the, this is fork, fish knife. This is the sauce. If I wanted to take my fish and put my sauce on the fish, I would use this. To get the sauce. To put my sauce on. Right on the fish. But this is to cut the fish with. Yeah, this, this tells the waiter, I'm resting. I'm, I'm still resting. talking, we're I'm resting. We're having a chat. I'm having a chat. Discussing business, doing whatever we're doing. Leave my plate alone. Right. This tells the waiter, I'm finished. And this tells the waiter, I'm European and I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I was talking, talking to Professor Brown about uh, how many of you are familiar with the work of Dame Edna, Dame Edna Everidge, from so several people. Dame Edna is a creation of an uh, Australian performance artist named Barry Humphrey. It, not a drag act, but a true, actual, comedic creation, the single funniest uh, one-person comedy show I've ever seen in my life, and, and I've been addicted to going to comedy shows for decades, is Dame Edna on Broadway. So we had Dame Edna uh, on the Food Network, and she's always you know, so proper and everything is so wonderful. And so I decided that we would shoot a little bit of a segment with Dame Edna at um, a hot dog stand in New York. So here is the way uh, the first part of that piece uh, turned out with a little background on Dame Edna, and if she ever comes around again, go see her. Here we go. Australia has brought the world kangaroo tail soup, ostrich on the barbie, the luscious pavlova dessert, and one other crazily exotic dish, Dame Edna Everidge. She's the creation of comedian Barry Humphreys, a blend of Don Rickles, Liberace, and Margaret Thatcher. Dame Edna is a blockbuster hit in her native Australia, and now she's conquering America in her Tony Award winning one <coughs> woman comedy show. Yes, darlings, it's me. I'm here in your midst at last. So the point was we started out with Dame Edna standing in front of this big hot dog stand. You know, the big, a crowd is gathering looking at this character out there waiting for me to show up and get her a hot dog. And um, look, it's so epic. 
perfect, isn't it, Bill? I've never been sure about Frank Ferdinand. I'm not certain what's inside it. <laughs> Look, it says, Look here. No chemical synthetics or artificial. Isn't that reassuring? <laughs> what a lovely crowd comes here, Bill. Can I treat well, you to a hot dog? Well, we actually just ordered it. Okay, I'll pay. American oh, hospitality. Yes. Of opportunity. <laughs> got to look good. We're New Yorkers. Thank you. I want to try one of your famous hot dogs. Three dogs coming up. What would you like on the hot dog? You have lots of choices. I want mustard. Mustard? Okay. I don't want to spill anything on this beautiful frock. I'm picking up the hot dog in just a moment. Look. How about a straw? Straws available? Thank you. Mustard. How is it, Dame Edna? I'm in love, ladies. What do we think, Dame Edna? Delicious! Mmm! Scrumptious! Anyway, there's Dame Edna at the hot dog stand at the corner of 72nd and Columbus. What's it called? Papaya King at the corner of 72nd and Columbus. So during the course of the series, you know, in the very beginning, it was really difficult to get celebrities to come for a couple of reasons. First off, no one really knew what the Food Network was. It's really the truth. And, you know, when I, I booked my first show with, with uh, Whoopi Goldberg, actually, uh, whom I had worked with on a comedy series, was nice enough to come and do the first show. And then Matt Lauer did the second show. And then Martha Stewart did the third show. So by getting a few people I knew on, it helped in, in the booking process. Uh, but the celebrities were always slightly nervous about being filmed while eating. Some would eat, some wouldn't eat. Uh, se several had a lot to drink. So all different kind of things happened during the course of, of the series. And we did about 100 shows. So I'd like to just take you through um, a couple of my favorite, some of my favorite moments uh, ranging from, um, let's see, well, it ends with Ivana Trump talking, and let's see, who else do I have? I, I, Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg is in there. Well, you'll see. If all, all familiar faces, Robert Duvall, uh, Richard Belzer, all familiar faces. Here are some, some of my favorite moments called out of 100 shows. And you're backstage at the Academy Awards. 30 seconds before you're going to come walking out, the camera's going to be on you. 50 million people all over the world look at you live. Mm -hmm. What's it feel like back there for you? Well, I'm really uncomfortable because it's probably one of the few times that I have to wear a bra. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically what I'm thinking about. My wish is that you have a wonderful year, a great life, and may your children never be on my show. This is your mother's recipe? Right, right, exactly. And Francis Ford Coppola wanted it? Yeah, I wouldn't give it to him. What about the Bell's diet, though? You have a philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about this one. Yeah, stay, stay away from anything that's white. No, no, no white, white sugar, food. white flour, Mayonnaise. salt, white people. <laughs> a lot of food. It's, it's, you're, a lot of, you're a lot of man. Inside every fat man is another fat man saying, how the hell with it? I'm having a little problem getting out, Bill. Would you give me a hand here? What? Pull you out like this? Yeah. That's it. Oh. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. You okay? Uh, yeah. Now. These New York taxis, it's not easy. One more for the Gipper. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay. Let's go. All set. Ready? What's on your refrigerator? I have another refrigerator for three lines. I'm not getting married. I'm not getting married. I'm not getting married. Honestly. <laughs> Actually, three times I must have to change that graphic. Okay, so let's talk about, the, I think, the pinnacle of the, um, of the series for me was the, the show we did with uh, the great Sophia Loren. I mean, a, a true screen goddess uh, who grew up in the most abject of poverty in, uh, during World War II. And what was so interesting about this was that the, the, it seemed like the bigger the star was, the more nervous everybody would be, and sometimes the bigger the star was, the more cooperative they would be. And I found Sophia Loren to be an enormously cooperative uh, guest, but of all the guests whom I work with on the series, none had a greater passion for food than Sophia Loren, because as a child, she virtually had no food. So the first part of this uh, little package that I put together for you once a feel around is a bit in the interview with her and her habit of every film she's ever made 
they set up a little kitchen for her and so forth. And then the second is just really delving into the, the hardships that she had to experience and how food can be so evocative to her, even the, the, the smallest thing. Like, for example, you, you may have a dish that your mother and father made, like pot roast or something like that, and you go to some place and, and you smell it, and suddenly your sense of smell brings back you know, the family around the table. For her, it was a different thing with pasta fazool. So let's take a look at wonderful Sophia Loren. One of the great perks of stardom for Sophia Loren was the simple ability to have a kitchenette with you yes. on, on location for many of the movies. Sometimes when I, when I go on location and I have to stay there a long time, like yeah. two months, uh, I always like to have a little corner where I can cook. I mean, not a big, kitchen, a big thing. But a little corner where I can cook sometimes, and uh, so it's the only way for me to feel really at home. It was also a way for you to connect with your your co-stars, like Some, Walter Matthau. Walter Matthau, so uh, how beautiful. Walter Matthau ends up on a list with Burt Lancaster, Richard Burton, Cary Grant, Frank Sinatra, Marlon Brando, <laughs> Alan Ladd, Walter Matthau, grumpy old man. What did he? What did you make for Walter Matthau? Uh, what well, I made um, pasta with a simple, uh, simple um, sauce, uh, simple tomato sauce. Right. How about Paul Newman? Now you did a movie with Paul Newman. Yeah. Have you tried Paul Newman's spaghetti sauce, his pasta sauce? No. Is it good? I, I enjoy it. It comes in a jar. Yeah. When's the last time you've had jarred pasta sauce? Never. When you never were a little child, seven or eight or nine years old, you were in. Abject poverty, World War II yeah. bombing going on around you. At one point, literally having to look out the window, seeing your mother beg for food on the street. You were a skinny little girl. The kids at school made fun of you. An illegitimate child, fatherless. For you, what was eating like during the war? There was no eating. There was no eating? No, there was no eating. We really haven't had nothing to eat. Really nothing to eat. We were really so starving. So on a day-to-day -day basis, oh, no. hunger. Starving, starving, absolutely. Uh, do you ever smell something, smell a dish, a pasta fazool or something like that that takes you all the way back to of that? Of course, location? that's why I wrote the book. That's why I associated this kind of the scent, the, the, the smell with, with food, of course. Mm. Sometimes the, 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 the smell of a pasta fagioli it can make me cry because I, I, I imagine always a, a scene with my grandmother in the kitchen. It's something very moving for me. And pasta fagioli is a very concrete and solid yeah, it's a, it's dish. A solid dish when, when you had the ingredients to put <laughs> that together. Nothing, there's nothing poetic about it. <laughs> By the way, Sophia Loren in person has the most beautiful green eyes I, I've ever seen. Now, each show that I did, I developed a signature, uh, say, tag question. <clears throat> Whoever the guest was, I asked the same question of all of them. And I'm going to ask it of you. I'll show you a couple examples of what the celebrities said. If, if some of you might want to come down here right in front of the stage and share your experience. Here was the question. Stop and think, OK? If you, and if you're watching your stateroom, and I see you around the ship and you have a good answer, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about it. Here was the question. If you could be beamed up like Star Trek, right, and beamed down anywhere in the world tonight, preferably at a place you've been, or maybe a place you're fantasizing about, but beamed up and beamed down anywhere in the world tonight for dinner, or once you're off the ship, beamed up and beamed down, we don't want to leave the ship. Where would you want to be? Where would your where would you want to return to where you've had a meal? Or where have you had your heart set on dining and why? And here's a couple examples of some of the answers that I got from the beam up question. Answer to this. If we could beam you up like Star Trek, you know, and beam you down anywhere else in the world. For dinner tonight, where would you like to be having dinner? I would have, I would love to be having dinner in the, any place in the old part of Madrid. The old part of Madrid. Why the, is that? Because this is, is my city. Yeah. It's city my city, birth. and the atmosphere there is unbelievable. I have to pick one. 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 
that really stands Tonight, out. One. It would have to be there's a there's a great restaurant in Ez. Where? Ez. E Z E. Hmm. It's a little medieval town high up on top of the clouds just outside of Monaco. Hmm. And it's part of a hotel called Chef de O. Tonight? Tonight. You're not working tomorrow, you and your husband. Anywhere in the world, where do you want to be? Uh, Venice. Where in Venice? Cipriani Hotel in Venice. Oh, outside, inside? <laughs> right on the water. Okay. I would, you know, I would say uh, La Tour d'Anjon in Paris. It was one of the most romantic, exquisite meals uh, I, I've ever had. Uh, it, it, it was right along the Seine in Paris, mm. uh, and you order, and they're famous for their duck, and uh, it was it was just spectacular. Okay, so let me see if any of you want to volunteer something for this. I'm going to come to, come on down. Wait, that's not, can you come down here just to the front? And the reason I say this is because if I go back there, the person watching their stateroom is just going to see like an empty stage with my head popping up. So come on down. Anybody else, come on down for a second, and I'll uh, just right here. What? Nice to see you. Yeah, what's your name? Mary Jo Martin. Uh, is the mic on? He'll get it. Should I yell? <laughs> OK. Mary Jo Martin. Mary Jo Martin. Yeah, and where are you from? Um, Chicagoland area. OK, that's a good Plainfield, area. Plainfield. OK, so I... now the same question I asked Placido Domingo, same question for you. If you could be beamed up down, where would you like to go? Back into my childhood, Christmas Eve in our basement with oh, the whole family. Wow. Grandma and Grandpa did all the cooking. And I'm Sicilian, so we had the Feast of the Seven Fish. Right. And I remember as a child, the live eels and snails and all the shellfish. Did, how did you feel about the child? You know, not too many children, are, uh, except in France, of course, with, they eat snails and eels you know, early in the morning for breakfast. How did you feel about that? Well, I enjoyed the food, you liked but, it. Yeah. but I would be embarrassed to bring it to school because I'd eat salami sandwiches with wow. provolone and everybody else was eating peanut butter and jelly. How ma and how <laughs> so many, they made fun of me. How many in the family would be down there in the basement on Christmas Eve? Oh, my Eve? goodness. It would be my aunts and uncles and my cousins. And, wow. Yeah. It it's was a good a, memory. It's, it's a, a very, great very memory. good memory and a great perfect memory. answer to the question. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for, how about someone else? Oh, good. Here comes a very fit gentleman. I can tell. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. What's your name, sir? My name's Chris Palmer. Excuse me? Chris, Chris Palmer. Chris, where are you from, Chris? Well, we live in um, a little fishing village in North Norfolk in the UK right now. OK, that sounds yeah. a little UK-ish. UK, and so it is UK we're going to yeah. beam you up, my friend, and beam well, you down where you want to be. It's a really difficult question, because my wife will tell you I've got about a 1,000 cookery books, and I cook from them and so forth and things like that. Um, so she always buys me birthday presents, Christmas presents. They're always about food and stuff. And um, one she's bought me twice, actually, is a, a day working in a Michelin star kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, there's a restaurant called Restaurant Sat Mains in, um, in Nottingham. And um, now, what do you, now why? What do you like about why? that? Why? What's um, that? Give us a name one more time. Restaurant Sat Baines. Okay. Sat Vindy's a senior restaurant. In and, Nottingham. And what, what, what draws you back to this what, restaurant? Um, because he does a sort of like an eight or ten course tasting menu, all sorts of little dishes with different different sort of flavor combinations of sweet, salty, and what sour. Were the, what yeah. were the circumstances when you were there originally? Uh, it was a birthday present. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Good. From my wife. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you. That's, that's a good. Okay. That's. We have one other person. Want to come down? No. All right. Yes, sir. Good. I appreciate this, and I got one little payoff for you, right in here. Thank you. And you are, so please. Uh, Lane Morris. I'm Lane. Yes. I like that name, as I thank told you. you. Where are you from, Lane? Uh, Burlington, Vermont. <sighs> Pennies in a stream, falling leaves, a sycamore. Right? Beautiful area. Moonlight in Vermont. So tell us where you'd like to uh, be beamed up and be down to. Well, it, it's a lot about the ambiance. Um, That's important. Middlebury, Vermont, uh, Tortorel. It's a restaurant that was, it was, a, it was a farmhouse. It was probably built in 1850. 
a lot of small rooms, wide champlain, uh, wood floor, like these trees are extinct now. And what kind of uh, food? French. French and food. a husband. Classical French or Nouvelle Cuisine? Uh, or? Uh, you're beyond it's my French, eating level uh, French. French. It's a French style And the, food. the chef is the husband, the host is um, his wife. And they have like six or eight tables, uh, very small French, multiple courses, fire in the fireplace, snow could be falling. Really, mm. just, just a beautiful. Lane, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. So give us the name, Burlington, Vermont, and the name of the restaurant uh, again Mid is? Middleburg, Vermont, Tortorelle, French restaurant. Uh, uh, Excellent. It's very it's very Not, nice. You meet uh, nice people there. Yeah, well, if you're one of them. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you, Thank Lane. You, Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay. Jane, thank you very much, my dear. I'll be right back. I want to close up the show. Um, on that segment, you saw um, Al Roker. For those of you not from the United States, he is uh, probably the most famous weatherman in the history of television in the United States, and a very funny guy. And we were taping a show together, and um, I know that Al, Al Roker loves grilling. In fact, he wrote a book years and years ago on grilling. So after we did the interview, this is not a Food Network show, but I, I still continue to use that same question from time to time. Um, we, I, I saw there was a grill over on the patio, and I said, yeah, I, Al, I want to do something. We moved one camera over, and I got him in front of the grill, and without any rehearsal, because he's very quick and very funny, I said, Al, I, I want your grilling tips. And off the top of his head, he came up with some really good stuff on grilling. So let's go to Al Roker to wrap up this presentation. Al's five great barbecue five tips. Five great barbecue tips are, okay, one, if you're a man, you use hardwood charcoal. Number two, don't move your meat. Three, do not, under any circumstances, especially if you're making burgers, do not take the spatula and go and because you know what you're doing? You're creating a hockey puck. Four, four. Do not use a fork to flip your steak around. Use tongs. Five, if you've got a good quality cut of meat, do not, under any circumstances, put steak sauce on it. It's ridiculous. Ketchup? No. No. Ketchup's even worse. Mustard? No. Relish? No. Right. Number six, do not wear one of those stupid aprons that say, kiss the cook. You get a t-shirt, a pair of shorts, you get stuff on it. Okay, can that's I kiss it. the cook now? <laughs> Al Roker. Well, that's a little bit of fun for you, thank you. Fun for you with the Food Network. Um, one of the questions I've been asked a lot is, you know, am I a foodie? It, my interest in food, essentially, and what qualified me to be on the Food Network was I have worn out cards credit cards in restaurants. I love dining out. My, I used to love going out with the family. And that and the combination of the round table thing made it happen for 10 years. Tremendous amount of fun at the Food Network. I'll be back with my final talk Friday, 6.45, and it's called the Rat Pack Revival. In this talk, I'm going to deconstruct how Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, Dean Martin, Joey Bishop, Peter Lawford got together in January of 1960 and created history in Las Vegas and how it wouldn't have happened if John F. Kennedy had not been running for president. So it's a, some interesting stories, some funny stuff, and some terrific historic video clips. That'll be Friday at 645. Meanwhile, I got hungry doing this. I think it's dinner time. Thank you very much. Thank you.